Our first day has come and gone so quickly. I am excited to invite you to our last session of day one of the Nature for Life Hub. So, as we know, nature promotes health, it promotes climate action, and it also promotes prosperous communities. Please join me in welcoming our next lineup of outstanding speakers for our last session of day, Nature for Prosperity, Nature-Based Jobs and Livelihoods, toward a new definition of nature-based prosperity. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Charlotte Legris de Lassalle. I'm a journalist live from Paris. I'm very honored and happy to moderate uh, this virtual summit today for you and with you. We will be together for um, 90 minutes, Nature for Prosperity session led by OP2B Coalition. OP2B uh, this is a unique international cross-sectoral and action-oriented business coalition on biodiversity with a specific focus on agriculture. OP2B alongside its partners from the Nature for Life Hub, including UNDP, UNEP and the WWF. We are here today uh, to address the central role of the agri-sector in paving the way uh, towards a sustainable transition for a better future for all and a greater impact on the planet. We are very lucky uh, to today to have a large panel of high-level speakers, civil society, business representative, institutional and governmental spokespeople, and cutting-edge thinkers from across the world who will be uh, joining us in an instant. Uh, for some of you, I know it's night time, it's very late, uh, while for others it's afternoon. So thank you again for joining us and being with us, being connected uh, for this major event all over the world. Our discussions will um, allow, uh, I hope, us to shed light on the existing solutions promoting new agricultural models, to identify also the underlying challenges, but also to share some insights uh, on the best ways to move collectively uh, forward on a global scale. We are, uh, are very honored to have with us tonight Emmanuel Faber. Uh, he is uh, the chair of uh, OP2B and also chairman and uh, CEO of Danone, along with Inger Anderson, UNEP's executive director. And I would like to welcome both of them. Hi. And uh, we'll be opening our session by introducing the global challenges and main issues related to nature, biodiversity and prosperity uh, from the United Nations perspective and from the business uh, point of view. Uh, Inger Anderson, hi, uh, welcome and thank you for being with us. Well, thank you. And thank you very much for doing this, Charlotte. And it's great to see Emmanuel and, um, and to have this chance to talk. Um, from our side, I don't know, would you like to first do a little round of introduction or do I just jump right in? I guess I jump right in. Yes, I would like to ask you a first uh, uh, question. Uh, I remind uh, for those who are just coming right now that you're the executive uh, director of the United States Environment Program. Of and the United Nations Environment Program, yes. And, uh, and um, what are in uh, your 
opinion, uh, the main challenges related um, to nature, biodiversity and prosperity as well at the same time we're facing right now. Um, how can we tackle them? Well, maybe we start where everybody's everybody's thoughts and priorities are on this pandemic and then we can work our way to biodiversity because we probably need to understand that the pandemic is sort of a, a message from nature in the sense, I mean, nature doesn't send messages, but nevertheless, uh, we have fragmented, deforested, uh, illegally traded, um, moved species from one continent to the other, uh, sat them on top of each other, or, 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 as I said, destroyed ecosystems um, to such a, a degree that we have these zoonoses. Zoonoses, obviously, being a disease that emerges in the in the animal world and then jumps to uh, humans. And we've had many: Ebola, HIV, H, N1, and H1, N1, Marburg, Nipah, West Nile virus, Lyme disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This disease, however, is efficient in that it's spread, as we all know, about aerosols. So we need to understand that you cannot continue pushing nature into a corner, figuratively speaking, and expect nature to just deliver for you. Um, they can't, right? You can't fragment, uh, destroy, etc. We have heard the IPES number, IPES being the twin, the scientific twin to IPCC, that we are set to lose about a million species out of the 7.8 million species that we have. That's not good enough. And when we're seeing that, and at the same time seeing that um, we've interfered with over 70% of the terrestrial land surface, we've altered it somehow, or that we have altered the sea, the marine environment, or over 60%. So we need to have a conversation about what that is. Because obviously we need to understand that biodiversity and nature writ large, it feeds us, as Emmanuel will tell us, it closes us, it houses us, it gives us the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. So then, and more very importantly, it regulates our weather. Uh, and so we cannot lose this. So then, what are then the options here? The options is clearly to think about what are the drivers that are that are causing these losses and there is one species that is the driver and that's us and that is our unsustainable production and our unsustainable consumption but we won't make food the enemy because we all have to eat so food has to be the friend and the ally and the one that can find the solutions and this is why I'm very pleased to be with Emmanuel right now, because there are real companies that are trying to make some of these shifts. Now, this is not easy, but states can also help by helping shift subsidies in the right direction, not towards nature negative, but towards nature positive, uh, not towards too much insecticides, pesticide and chemicals uh, to avoid fragmentation, better land use planning. Each of these elements are important. And then us how we consume, how we waste. Um, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of CO2. So we buy the food, we put it in the refrigerator, it goes in the garbage, or in the production line, much is lost. Each of these are elements that we need to consider because we're wasting food, we're wasting water, we're wasting land, we're wasting resources. And soon we will be 10 billion on this good earth. And it's simply not sustainable. The good news is that right now we are taking money out of taxpayers' pockets um, and putting it into stimulus. And so now we have a real opportunity of making that stimulus work. We will not in our lifetime, I hope, see so much money, these trillions of dollars going from the public purse into the economy in this way. So goodness me, we have to be sure that that money is not going to fund the destructive, the dirty and the gray economy, but it's going to fund the green and the sustainable and the constructive. So what does that mean? That means that the bailouts that we're doing have to come with green strings attached. That means that investments in what we refer to as nature-based solutions, sustainable agriculture, renewables, conservation, and green infrastructure in cities, each of these have to be part and parcel of the solution. It means 
that when we're investing in research and development, it should be green research and development. It means that when we are looking at, re at, at right now, we should be reinforcing environmental legislation, not back uh, backslided. So these are the kind of opportunities that we have. And we know that nature-based jobs and livelihoods are particularly relevant in the agricultural sector. Agricultural production employs many more people than any other economic sector globally. Currently, there are 167 million farms, that's 29% worldwide, that are already practicing sustainable agriculture and sustainable intensification. So we can just, we just need to do more of that. We actually just need to switch the incentives. And then you and I, as consumer, we should also have the opportunity to, when we go into the supermarket, to select things that we know are sustainable. So we need to have a way of knowing that, which obviously is about brands and labels. And all of that sort of pulled together really does mean that we can begin to pull back from the destructive path that we are on. Next week, we'll have the Nature Summit. Uh, here at the United Nations. It'll be virtual, unfortunately. And next year in Kunming, we will have the COP15. It's called 15 as well, just like the Paris COP, but this is on biodiversity. And that COP will need to find a new framework for biodiversity. And each of these pieces, the fragmentation, the, the et cetera, et cetera, that I spoke about are part and parcel of the solution. Earlier this week, the Global Biodiversity Outlook came out from my colleague, Elizabeth Marema, who is the head of the um, Biodiversity Convention Secretariat. And we got a failing scorecard. The report card we took home from that report is, we have failed. We cannot afford to fail again. Young people are in the streets demanding it. And if COVID hasn't taught us anything, it is that we must act because the price we are paying now for COVID, and this would be my last point, Charlotte, the price we're paying now for COVID is nothing compared to if we fail to take action on climate, if we fail to take action on biodiversity, and if we fail to take action on pollution. Thank you. For this, um very clear uh, picture uh, of the of the overall uh, context um the emmanuel uh, emmanuel faber you know inger uh, very very well and as um, the chairman and ceo of danon which is uh, one of the largest uh, uh, french agro um, alimentary companies of course you're very aware uh, of uh, everything that Inger uh, just said, responding to, to her. I would like to ask you, what role do you think business businesses and business leaders um, can, I, can have in building a more uh, sustainable and inclusive, inclusive future? Thank you, Charlotte. And uh, I would like to uh, thank Inger for her powerful words and actually for all the support and the energy that she brings in uh, driving uh, together uh, the climate and the nature agenda. I was uh, thrived last year uh, for the first time during the UNGA that uh, we were actually going to tackle both at the same time because nature is part of the climate solution and climate is part of the nature solution. We need to absolutely have this joint agenda. I think the, the, the theme of uh, nature for prosperity is is really interesting because, you know, we, we at Danone, we have a framework of action that uh, we've called uh, One Planet, One Health. In other words, uh, the health of the planet and the health of people are completely intertwined. One is the essence of the other and vice versa. And that very much echoes what I heard from, uh, from Inger. So if we think about nature for prosperity, the question of what is prosperity is there. Uh, in, and, and very simply, there cannot be people prosperity if there is not planet prosperity. People prosperity first. You know, if we spend all the money that Inge mentioned uh, in the recovery and the support and the packaging and the stimuli in the traditional way that we want to grow GDP as fast as possible, as soon as possible, that's one measurement of prosperity the very basic one that we've been using for decades and that led the business system where it is today. And that led exactly to the crisis that we are having, which is as, you know, 
as Inge said, maybe not a message, but at least a clear signal that we cannot ignore the prosperity of nature. So we will have to redefine what human prosperity means, way beyond the question of GDP. To turn back to a system and to a civilization that indeed can work in harmony with nature and not ignoring it or putting it in a corner because we believe that we don't need it. I think it's a, it's a clear time for us to sign an alliance with nature. A new alliance that will provide humankind with the resilience that it needs as a species because the system that we've built is just collapsing. So when it comes to the nature prosperity, the planet prosperity, the incredible thing about agriculture um, is that unlike the heavy industries where the CO2 emissions that they drop in the air, they cannot take this CO2 back into the oil pit where it initially belongs, deep under the surface of planet Earth. But that's exactly the magic that what agriculture can do. Because it's not only able to sink carbon in the soil, instead of emitting carbon, depending on the agricultural practices, but it can actually make sure that the carbon is being sunk in the soil is the basis for nurturing the soils themselves. There cannot be planet prosperity without soil prosperity. The soil prosperity is related to how much organic matter there is, how much life there is in soils. And yes, we have uh, touched one way or the other 70% of the soils around the surface of the planet, as Inger just said, but 40% of those are degraded today because we're extracting the carbon from the soil and the carbon is the structure of the soil. It's actually 60% of its organic matter, 60% supporting the life in the soil. So that's where the connection with biodiversity takes place because if there is one thing that the food system, that the textile, that the consumer goods system, that the cosmetic uh, system can build by extracting in a different way the resources from the soil, a way that has to be regenerative, where it means that we cannot extract more than the speed at which the soil can regenerate its resources. If we are able to do this, we will both address the climate topic related to agriculture. And today, agriculture globally is the equivalent of the whole of industry when it comes to net greenhouse gas emissions. But also, we will deal with biodiversity, because that's where the point is. We are all um, um, uh, you know, completely overwhelmed by the loss of wild biodiversity, the loss of species, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of them. But the fact is that the missing link between humankind and wild biodiversity is agricultural biodiversity. We have monocropped uh, very vast areas of lands, deforesting, uh, uh, significant areas of land to install a model that is going nowhere today. So the One Planet Business for Biodiversity Coalition that I had the joy and energy to present uh, in the General Assembly of the UN exactly a year ago on behalf of the 25 companies that have joined this coalition with the support of people and institutions like UNEP and, and INGER and also from the CBD and others. Um, that coalition is addressing that fact. We cannot look at biodiversity only as a corporate social responsibility topic or a communication topic or a no harm topic as a business. We need to look at it as the resilience of our own system. Our own food system relies on the biodiversity that we will be able to put back into the soil and into the fields. Into the fields because today, 75% of the calories that humans intake uh, in the world is related to only six plants, six plants only. And in many areas, we have lost completely this cultural biodiversity. So as a group of companies, we've committed to make sure that we would implement regenerative agriculture 
agriculture that respects soil health, that restores carbon in all our supply chains. And we have developed a very interesting, I think some of that will be uh, shared during the session, compendium of practices, nearly 50 of them, that around the world show that that can be done at scale, first of all. We have then pledged that we would increase the amount and the diversity of the ingredients, the species, the varieties, both animal and vegetal, that we are using in the food products that we are proposing to our consumers. And that's a huge change because we are really talking about the biodiversity that we can directly address before protecting and while protecting the wild biodiversity on which we believe the third axis for this coalition is about radically new ways to approach deforestation. So I'm sharing this because I truly believe that what we gather together is absolutely fundamental because the time is now. There is no way that we can come back to before. We need to progress and we need to finally understand that nature works for us and we cannot work against it. Thank you so much for participating in the, this session of today. Thank you. Yeah, it's time to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel, and thank you both for your uh, impact full uh, inter interventions and now we we're gonna go forward on, on the first panel let's move uh, on uh, this uh, first panel of uh, six uh, speakers to discuss the challenges of an ecosystem on the edge and to uh, highlight local field proven solutions developed by some committed stakeholders uh, what is Prosperity, asked Emmanuel Faber, it's people prosperity first, it is a soil uh, prosperity. Uh, what are the best ways to move forward? What are the concrete models we can be inspired from and uh, we can uh, re replicate? Uh, we're going to discuss it with uh, our guests our speakers, you can discover them on the screen. We have first Margaret Kinnaird, uh, Global Wildlife Practice Leader at World Wildlife Fund International. Fabrice de Clerc, Senior Scientist, specialized in all matters related uh, to food and biodiversity, from a conversation, con conservation to food production and consumption. Uh, Magdi Batato, Executive Vice President and Head of Operations at Nestle. Oh, yes, you can leave this video now. Uh, hi. Welcome for those who are already uh, there. Uh, Justine Abea, Biodiversity and Africa Area Sustainable Ingredients Manager at L'Occitan uh, Group. Joss von Ostrom, Director, ah, here they are, all of them, Director <laughs> of Sustainable Solution at Mars. And finally, Marilyn, uh, Marlin Sambung, Service and Finance Director on, um, for Mars in Indonesia. Uh, she couldn't be with us right now, but you're going to see she sent us a pre-recorded um, message. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you very much for uh, being with us tonight. Hi. 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 Uh, hi. hi. We're going to start uh, with you, Margaret, as one um, of the world's largest and most experienced uh, independent, it's important conservation organization, how WWF is tackling this agriculture and biodiversity challenge uh, we just talked about. Thank you. Uh, first, let me say it's, it's a pleasure and an absolute honor to be here. Um, and let me just kick off with a mention of the Living Planet Index 2020, which is really another flag that our planet is in trouble. The index shows a 68% average decline in monitored vertebrate populations since 1970. The primary cause for these catastrophic declines is habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation, driven mainly by how we produce our food. We've already altered one third of the world's land surface for agriculture, yet forests, savannas, and wetlands continue to be destroyed to produce our food. Business as usual may cost us $10 trillion in economic losses by 2050. Plus, 
as mentioned earlier, we will see species driven to extinction. And with all the important roles that they play in pollination, seed dispersal, and soil maintenance will be lost. We need to totally rethink the way we produce and consume our food, as others said before me. I mean, fortunately, we know the transformative actions needed to flip agriculture from being a threat to biodiversity to being an enormous opportunity to restore nature and feed humanity. We need a holistic approach where governments, businesses, civil society deliver credible action to increase the conservation potential of our food supply chains. And a promising pathway is the practice of agroecology. Um, it's based on local knowledge of the ecosystem, the functions of biodiversity and ecological processes like pest control and soil fertility. Agroecology enhances biodiversity instead of depleting it and helps agricultural landscapes thrive. So WWF is applying these approaches in more than 20 countries worldwide, helping restore ecosystems above and below ground, build soil life, store carbon, and provide livelihoods to millions of people. So with these ap approaches, food production can be part of the solution to biodiversity loss instead of the problem. And in addition, Agriculture has a key role to play in rebuilding connectivity in fragmented landscapes. Fragmentation often leaves wildlife you know, unable to disperse and impedes critical ecological processes like steam flow, stream flows and pollination that are essential for sustaining agricultural production. Increasingly, farmers that we're working with are realizing that they can promote ecological connectivity by thoughtfully managing production zones. In Malaysia, for example, a reforested corridor through an oil palm plantation connects previously isolated forests, allowing orangutans and other wildlife to move freely between them. Um, other farmers are changing practices to ensure their croplands are ecologically permeable by providing structural improvements like hedgerows, nesting platforms, and buffer zones around waterways that allow the flow of wildlife. So agriculture can provide essential services to the natural ecosystems in which they occur, allowing for ecologically connected landscapes, which are healthier, more resilient to climate change, and better able to provide crucial services to the human communities living within them. And as Inger reminded us, let let's not forget that one third of our food is wasted. Food loss takes place from farm to fork due to inadequate storage and rigid distribution or buying practices. I mean, there are 700 million people in the world going hungry every day, yet we throw away perfectly edible food that winds up in landfills where it rots and releases greenhouse gases. If we all shopped, cooked, and ate a little smarter, we could avoid wasting food. I feel like we're, we're very much now at a crossroads. I mean, can we join forces as farmers, conservationists, consumers, and corporates to make the switch from agriculture as a threat to biodiversity to being its savior? We have the tools, the solutions are in sight, and with the right will and truly collective action, we absolutely can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, you you just told us that there is a, a strong a strong scientific evidence, of course, of nature uh, degradation. But um, science is not just about measuring what we are losing. Um, we know that we can also point towards proven solutions with me measurable impacts. We have tools, you just said it. Uh, Fabrice, your um, scientific uh, perspective uh, maybe can help us uh, today understand uh, the, the current biodiversity emergency that we're in and the, the fundamental role that actors across the food value chain uh, can and must play to support um, environmental uh, restoration and regeneration. 
Uh, Fabrice, do you do you hear me? And and could you say a word about that? Très bien, Charlotte. Bonjour de Montpellier. I hope everything's Hi. well in Paris. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you all. But Fabrice de Clerc, an agricultural scientist and ecologist, and I, I think you know biodiversity can be really confusing to many people. But there's there's two critical goals that I think you're hearing repeatedly spoken about that I think we need to keep in mind. But the first is, is species and ecosystems that are imperiled with extinction. Inger uh, and, Ever and Emmanuel have all spoken to the devastation that land conversion has on nature. And we have to absolutely keep at least half of each ecoregion intact or conserved or restored in order to protect and to halt that extinction loss. But second, and the piece that I think we don't recognize nearly enough is that biodiversity is more than unique species and ecosystems, that the biosphere is what makes life on earth possible. This is what allows carbon to move, as Emmanuel described, from atmosphere into biosphere and a major defense against a climate change amongst a myriad of ecosystem services. So we have to be much better at sharing our spaces with nature or increasing ecological integrity. So, so I'd like to say that we have to spare at least half for nature and we must absolutely share the rest for ecological integrity. Or in other words, no net loss with a rapid transition to nature positive uh, this decade. The data is really alarming and you've heard some statistics, but while we see that half of the earth remains intact. This is strongly biased towards boreal regions, large extensive forest regions in Northern Canada, Northern Russia, uh, and in the Nordic region. Our analysis of 1700 unique country ecoregions, unique ecosystems within a country, finds that 72% of those uh, country ecoregions have less than half of their area intact. These are trending then to extinct uh, ecosystems, if you will. Also, what we're finding is that 27 of those country ecoregions have insufficient biodiversity in agriculture to support ecosystem services. That is 27% of our agricultural lands can no longer rely on pollination services, pest control services, or other ecosystem services in support of agriculture. And this really is alarming because this is a place where we've not only lost species, but we've lost a function. Multiple models now showed and, and confirmed repeatedly that there isn't a conflict between food security and environmental security, but rather that we are able to begin to bend the curve on biodiversity loss by 2030, but only, as you heard many people say today, with integrated approach that maintains habitat conservation, halts conversion, improves production practices, and shifts a consumption of, of food towards healthy, sustainable diets. And what we find is that those three levers does allow us to bend the curve on biodiversity loss by 2030. The latest of these studies we just published in Nature earlier this month, a consortium of more than 50 of the world's leading conservation of biologists. It's really past time, however, that we recognize that, that after oceans, the world's biggest ecosystem is, is agricultural ecosystems, right? 40% of the Earth's ice-free service is covered by agricultural and rangelands. And while nature positive will absolutely happen, in protected areas and intact areas. The biggest opportunity for nature positive is in agricultural landscapes where we have a history of management interventions. And as Emmanuel very clearly pointed out, through photosynthesis, through plant production, we can take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back in soils. So, so commitments by the food and agricultural sector to halt expansion into intact ecosystems, which currently cover about half of the Earth's surface, which play a frontline role in combating climate change are urgently and absolutely needed and require the commitments of private sector as well as support of governments and citizenry. But I think the private sector has an even more proactive role to play, a nature positive role to play in transitioning to regenerative agriculture. This is more than just sustainable. Sustainable is no longer enough. We're, we're, we're past the due date for sustainable. We have to shift into regeneration and really being to rebuild the nature that we've lost. So not just transitioning agricultural lands into carbon sinks, but ensuring that in these landscapes, there's enough habitat for biodiversity, connectivity, as we just mentioned, species that support food production, pollination, pest control. And we have to make sure that regenerative agriculture is principles-based, that it's measured against these targets, carbon, biodiversity, water quality, soil quality, and that we leave room for the diversity of practices in regions on the ground, context-specific practices that meet those goals.
Finally, uh, we need to be much better at diversifying food systems all along the value chain. Diversity in our farms and our fields to diversity in our plates. We talk a lot about meat reduction. This has a huge impact on freeing up land for conservation, but there is a universal need to increase the dietary diversity of, of our diets. Overconsumption and low dietary diversity are one of the biggest drivers of poor dietary health, leading to 11 million premature deaths uh, per year. If we could increase production and consumption of fruits, nuts, vegetables, beans, fossils, and whole grains, we both make a contribution to biodiversity conservation, and we have huge impact on, on public health. This is a massive opportunity to be better uh, at matching crops to environmental conditions and dietary needs. My colleagues at EATS, at the Lancet Commission, and the recent Bain of Biodiversity Curve paper led by David Leclerc at the Yassa, we don't want to be naive in stating how challenging this will be. This will absolutely require massive investment, massive effort. However, we are completely convinced, and the data does support, that it's completely possible that with sufficient political will, private sector innovation, and public imagination that we can bend the curve on biodiversity loss by, by 2030. Thanks all for, for your attention and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Fabrice. We have seen with you that it's uh, uh, both necessary and urgent, and we understand together uh, today that um, it, it cannot be achieved without a meaningful uh, and purpose-driving private sector uh, action and collaboration with uh, policymakers, academics, and civil society. Uh, as a business, it is indeed essential that we identify together um, practices that work, that are uh, scientifically sound and economically viable at the same time. Uh, I would like to have um, the insight of Magdi, uh, who is with us uh, uh, today. Uh, can, you, can you tell us, Magdi, why uh, biodiversity protection and restoration are um, fundamental from a business uh, perspective and the role that a company is should play. Good evening, good morning to, to all of you. Indeed, it is important for the business because let's take Nestle, the biggest food and beverage company in the world. We rely to a great extent on the natural environment for our success. So protecting and restoring it is a business imperative. It's about our own sustainability. You know, we have been around for 154 years and we would like to stay around for another 150 years at least. And on top of that is the right thing to do for the planet, for the people. We have a big role to play, but of course we cannot do this alone. And that's precisely why we are very happy and proud to be part of that OP2B work in this area. But it's not only about being part of a coalition and it's not only about, you know, making commitments, although you know, we have made uh, commitments. We aim to safeguard biodiversity, reach net zero greenhouse by 2050, but it's also about action. And we are a company, and I have to say, we take pride to be boots on the ground. And we have already made a lot of progress on this. For example, earlier this week, we announced a new initiative in Malaysia to plant 3 million trees. And also in the Americas, our project with one tree planted to plant a further three million trees is underway. All of the trees grown have been sourced in partnership with the World Resources Institute. In Côte d'Ivoire, we are partnering with the government to protect and restore forests within the Cavalli Protected Forest Reserve. But we are a brand company and we are a consumer-facing company. So our brands are also leading us forward on this journey. Just last week, you might have picked it up. Our CEO, Mark, talked about it yesterday in a panel. And Nespresso announced its intention to reach carbon neutrality by 2022. And many other household brands and names will follow. I would like also to take this opportunity in the spirit of what we are doing, action and boots on the ground, to highlight a specific project close to my heart and to our hearts in Nestle. We are working on this in Europe to start. We are supporting farmers and other organizations in Spain, France, Germany, and Italy to improve our sourcing of vegetables, which we use in a lot of our products. In, for example, the Maggi, the Maggi brand we have. 
Uh, this project is helping improve farming practices to keep more carbon and water in the soil. It also reduces chemicals used in pest control and, of course, introduces technologies to help farmers make better decisions. And from a farm management perspective, it improves their margins. So all this is important for people, for planet, but also for the business. Our approach then creates value for the long term for farmers by reducing costs, by restoring soil health, and as I said earlier, maximizing yield. The same approach could be introduced for a range of other crops, which we intend to do. So we welcome greater involvement from private sector partners as well, and others to scale up our success to date. I have in a couple of seconds, a short video that uh, I will show on a couple of minute video to explore this project more in detail and to showcase specifically what we are doing for onions in France that go into our food products in France. The Nestlé Sustainable Sourcing Program aims to ensure the respect of ethical standards and also to reduce the environmental impact of agricultural practices along the company's vegetable supply chain. Within the framework of this program, Fundación Global Nature and the Sustainable Agriculture Network are engaging with different Nestlé suppliers across Europe to assess the current situation of their operations at farm level and to take advantage of uncovered improvement opportunities. Nous sommes ici dans le nord de la France pour le programme Creative Shared Value de Nestlé, qui fait partie du programme plus général d'approvisionnement responsable dans la filière légumes de Nestlé. Et nous sommes ici euh, chez le partenaire de Nestlé, fournisseur d'oignons, Sodeleg, euh, qui est engagé dans le, dans le programme avec euh, ses agriculteurs. Donc dans le cadre de, du euh, Responsible Sourcing de Nestlé, euh, nous avons travaillé avec euh, cinq agriculteurs locaux afin euh, d'améliorer la biodiversité. Et pour ce faire, on va mettre en place euh, entre 10 et 15 euh, ruches Dans les, dans les exploitations tout proche de nos parcelles d'oignons. Proche de ces ruches, on va implanter quelques bandes de jachères mellifères, donc à base de, de mélange de différentes plantes, toutes, toutes particulièrement appréciées par les abeilles pour la production de miel. Afin de réduire également la pression phytosanitaire dans les parcelles, nous avons investi dans des stations météo qui sont reliées à des des logiciels de prédiction de l'apparition du mildiou. Donc on les a essayés sur l'année 2019, sur les récoltes 2019. Les résultats sont encourageants et on, et on reconduit l'opération pour l'année prochaine. We just uh, saw this uh, this movie about the the sustainable uh, sourcing uh, program. Um, it's uh, the proof of your commitment to to tackle the the climate change. Uh, can you tell us why it is so important to safeguard the biodiversity? Look, uh, you know we have made that uh, commitment in September last year, and uh, we did it before the UN Climate Week. Uh, we announced our intention to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions throughout our entire value chain. So this is from farm to fork. And the first thing, and we started way before this commitment, is stopping deforestation. You know, it's important. We talk about planting trees, we talk about biodiversity, but we have a very rich story out there and we should not, you know, uh, compromise on deforestation. So that's the first thing. And for us, this is one of the most effective ways in which companies like us can reduce carbon emissions and help safeguard biodiversity. It's so important. And this is a job which is still unfinished. So I can only invite other companies to finish the job. Mm -hmm. Through the use of technologies, including satellite imaging, we have teamed up with Airbus, uh, with the system Starlink, to monitor, uh, to monitor this. So this is really to boost the efforts and accelerate. Because we have discovered we needed... 10,000 people and more, maybe 50,000 people on the ground. So we have a mix now of boots on the ground, but also technology to help us accelerate this journey. And we are proud to, to say by the end of this year, we will be at 90% of key agricultural commodities that we purchase, which will be verified deforestation free. You know, the target was 100. 
we could have been at 100 by the end of this year, but we would not, we did not want to leave the small farmers, you know, because it's livelihood of farmers is also important. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about biodiversity is complex and it's many components, but we will be at 100 in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. We will also safeguard biodiversity by, of course, tackling climate change through supporting a transition to more regenerative agriculture methods. Emmanuel said earlier, of course, 75% of nutrition is based on few plants. So it's our role putting in place new recipes and having a more, you know, natural climate solutions, restoration projects to help remove those uh, greenhouse emissions from the atmosphere. So it's all of that that is important. Uh, thank you. And in one word, um, how can it be, uh, what are the benefits for the rural communities, briefly? Well, th there are a number of benefits, as I said earlier. Uh, firstly, uh, we need to, of course, enhance their livelihoods. This is what we, we have uh, talked about earlier. Uh, this includes uh, a lot of, of things we are doing, uh, uh, you know, on the ground. For example, uh, access to better data and knowledge on how to manage crops, uh, the potential to reduce fertilizers, I talked about it, and pesticides, and boost incomes of farmers, and perhaps most importantly, to help uh, safeguard resources for future generations of farmers. Uh, we have an agropreneurship program because we want the sons and daughters of farmers to continue to manage the land and stay farmers, uh, because this is part of what we need in the future. As we continue to see extreme weather events affecting agriculture around the world, it's more important than ever that we help farmers improve their resilience. And the project uh, I just showed in Europe is something we can learn from and scale in other parts of the world too. So climate change and nature loss are global issues, and we need to spread those best practices and scale up the impact. Thank we you. have the size to be able to have an impact, and we want to have an impact. Thank you for those. Sorry, I'm passionate about those subjects. So yeah, thank you will, you. I can talk for hours. I, I, I thank you for your passion, and we all share it um, together. But we would like to hear uh, now from uh, Justine. Justine from uh, L'Occitane Group. Uh, Justine, you you work uh, at improving practices uh, hand in hand with your uh, suppliers. Hi, Justine. Welcome. We can't hear you. Uh, can you just check your uh, your mic, uh, please? And, yes, I think oh, it's fine now. Thank you. Um, we, you at L'Occitane, I was saying that you work hand in hand uh, with your uh, suppliers. And um, at what extent, for example, the she butter uh, production contributing to uh, biodiversity and people livelihood in a country like Burkina Faso? Yes, um, shibaro is one of the most iconic ingredients for Luxtan Group. Uh, it's a she tree grow uh, widely in uh, West Af uh, Africa, and uh, it's uh, an extraordinary wildlife habitat. Uh, it prevents soil erosion and it stores carbon too. And since the 80s, uh, we saw this uh, crucial supply from rural women in Burkina Faso. Every year, we buy hundreds of tons of organic fair trade certified she butter directly from a community of more than 10,000 women. Um, our business model has been recognized as a, an exemplary inclusive business by the UNDP. Mm -hmm. And to go back to your question, yes, we know that she butter production can contribute to biodiversity and people livelihood by creating a fair income for the producers. And because when the producers earn a fair income from the sheet trees, they are encouraged to protect the sheet trees. So I can give you a few examples of our action. So firstly, to protect the resource, we have developed sheet trees protected area in partnership with women and also with local authorities. And thanks to that, women who collect the nuts are able to have a secure access of organic nuts. So they have also a better revenue from that organic nuts. Uh, secondly, I can speak about the traditional process of she butter used to be made with wood energy. And we know that it can contribute to deforestation. 
So what we have done, we replace all the wood by using waste valorization in a circular model. And this process now can contribute uh, the Shibata supply chain to be carbon positive. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have some images to illustrate what you uh, just uh, described. And I would like to uh, uh, share this, uh, this video with everyone. Thank you. L'arbre à qualité est sauvage, il ne se plante pas, il ne se coupe pas. Nous le récoltons exclusivement où il pousse dans les zones protégées. Au mois de janvier, les premiers bourgeons. Au mois de mars, les premières fleurs. Les fruits de qualité sont ramassés entre mi-juin et mi-septembre pour fabriquer le beurre de qualité. Ici, avec notre groupe de femmes, nous protégeons ces arbres et ces forêts. Nous nous occupons de la récolte et de la transformation. L'Occitane a contribué vraiment à la mise en place de l'usine et nous accompagne pour l'améliorer davantage. Notre méthode, c'est issue du barattage et c'est la méthode artisanale traditionnelle de production. On s'est inspiré des instruments qu'elles utilisaient pour mécaniser en fait le travail pour elles. Nous nous transmettons les recettes ancestrales de mère en fille. Bénéficier des revenus réguliers nous permet de se faire respecter dans nos familles et nous donne le droit de s'exprimer dans notre communauté. Oui, à partir du moment que l'Occitane a commencé à lancer leur commande avec nous, vraiment notre vie a changé. On arrive à payer les scolarités de nos enfants, de la santé. Et c'est nous les femmes qui sommes les vraies patates au bout du monde. Thank you uh, for these uh, remarks and for this uh, uh, video. Uh, in addition to, to limit uh, natural loss, we have to work on the recovery of the ecosystems that are essential for biodiversity. Uh, this is uh, what a corporation such as Mars has been uh, doing, investing in nature, restoration. And I would like to, to talk about it with Joss, uh, with, his, uh, with us uh, today. Thank you, welcome, and the floor is yours. It's a pleasure. Hi, Charlotte. Yes, um, so, right. Well, first of all, um, thank you for, uh, for having us. And um, Mars fundamentally believes that there is a progressive role for business in, in building back a better world for people and planet. Our purpose is quite simple. We say the world we want tomorrow starts with how we do business today. And it challenges every day to fix what is broken, be it inequality, poverty, and the degradation of nature. And as a privately owned family business, we have the unique freedom to think and act in terms of generations. Our initial investment of about $1 billion has helped us reduce our environmental footprint and meaningfully improve the lives of people in our supply chain. However, there is so much more to be done. And the previous speakers have challenged uh, the private sector, of course, rightly so. This is why Mars is actively looking for solutions to help restore the regenerative capacity of the ecosystems under threat on land and below water. So we got into the restoration of coral reefs and people might ask why? Well, our business and many of the farmers we source from depend on coral reefs. They are our ocean's engine of productivity and biodiversity and it's rivaling that of tropical rainforests and we are losing them at an alarming rate. So we decided to act. We've developed ReStars, and it's a system to rapidly rebuild reefs literally from the bottom up. We've been able to increase the coral cover to 60% within two years, triple numbers of fish, and double the numbers of fish species. The result is close to five hectares 
that's five Olympic stadiums, of healthy, diverse, and productive coral reef that can support local communities that depend on them. We would not be able to do this without local communities, scientists, governments, and NGOs, and other businesses around the world. So we see our role as being restoration activists, as well as catalysts by helping others. And partnership sits right at the heart of the approach that we take to bring solutions to incredible challenges. We want to applaud the UN decade of ecosystem restoration, and we will promise to play our part in ensuring that life below water gets the attention and investment it deserves. A world of restored healthy coral reefs thriving alongside resilient coastal communities is a powerful vision and one that we let slip at our peril. We must keep it in sight. So thank you, and I think there's a little video to show our work. We travel to meet Marlene Sambang, who lives and works in Indonesia uh, for Mars. She will present their action on the ground and tell us why coral reef restoration is so important. Let's hear from her. Hi, everyone. I'm Marlene Sumbung. I'm Service and Finance Director in Mars, Indonesia. I'm based in Sulawesi, Indonesia. Over the last 25 years, Mars, Indonesia has worked to develop cocoa growing and processing in Sulawesi. We work with 40,000 farmers and produce cocoa for our much-loved chocolate brands around the world. We work very closely with the farmers, ranging from improved varieties, farm diversification, enhancing pollination, testing our scientific solution-based approach to improve the livelihoods of the farmers. So why coral reef, you may think? Fish is a big component and is the central of the livelihood of the Indonesian communities. These are the communities where we saw our raw materials from. In Indonesia, the biggest threat to the reef is the human destruction. That's why we had to act and work with the two islands communities in the Supermonde Archipelago, just off coast of Makassar, and scientists to find a solution to fix the damage. Ten years later, the local island communities are involved in all aspects of the reef restoration, including making of the reef stars, attaching the corals, and now we celebrate together as we see the fish and corals returning. The reef restoration program is widely recognized here, but not just locally, but also national level. I still remember clearly signing the Memorandum of Understanding with the government highlighting our method as an effective tool in the restoration toolbox and use across Indonesian marine parks. Three parks have successfully restoring coral using our method. 
it was such a proud moment and since then it has also been a point of attraction for us for the young millennials in terms of campus visit job fairs and also recruitment it's certainly turning heads wherever we share it and as an Indonesian is a great feeling to be able to have this positive impact and which resonates at home but as well around the world thank you Thank you, thank you for um, at all the the panelists who who, who participated at this first uh, uh, panel and sharing with us the challenges um, we are facing um, in your industry and the very insightful uh, solutions you are uh, putting um, in place. Um, Fabrice is still uh, with us, and um, I would be delighted to have just a quick, quick word um, to wrapping up briefly this first panel. Hi, Charlotte. No, I think I think that, you know, I'll keep it very short because I know that we're a bit behind time. But I think what we've seen both is, is the need for, for change. And I think through the solutions that we've seen from different companies is, is very proactive efforts that address both the biodiversity and the livelihood challenge at the same time. Livelihoods in Burkina Faso, through shea butter and conservation. I think dramatic images regarding restoration of coral reefs uh, that we've just saw really think demonstrate that that when we put our energy and our imagination to it we really can begin to become transformative and regenerative so i'd like to thank all the speakers and thank you for for hosting us through this first session okay thank you thank you uh, very much moving on right now to the uh, remarks interlude of this session during which um our three speakers will be sharing their points of view from a farmers um a consumers and the young generations uh, perspective you will hear from uh, sota sok managing director of the Combundium farmers um association and board members of the world's farmer organization kanika sengi partners and and associate uh, director at the Boston Consulting Group in Mumbai, leading BCG Center for uh, Customer Insight in India, and Kaluki Paul Mutuku, a Kenyan-based young climate advocate and an environmental uh, defender. They have uh, pre-recorded um, videos from their respective countries, which is um, Cambodia, India, and Kenya for us. And um, I think maybe we can can, uh, we could um, listen from them uh, right now. Eighty percent of the population live in rural area, and the kickhouse employ forty-five percent of the workforce. In also in Asian, small dairy farmer provide up to eighty percent of food supply. We need to develop a good agriculture practice model that can regenerate our nature. We cannot live without agriculture, no agriculture, no food, and no development. It is time now to restore our forests, soil, lake, river, Thailand area, and grassland field to recover our planet with green landscape. Now, we need to take care of our nature because the nature also not only provide earth fertile soil for agriculture, nutrient food, but also biodiversity, species on land and water, habitat for wildlife to keep our planet sustainable. We need to take call the issue of smaller farmers through capacity building, training, access to market, water, capital, technical support for agriculture standard for long-term visibility, scale up innovative agriculture practice, and to increase active participation of young farmers in agriculture. It is now the necessity for farmer organization to build partnership with all stakeholders, such as private sector, big company, international organization, and development partner. The interest in sustainability from consumers' perspective has never been higher. BCG's survey with consumers across eight markets reveals that in the wake of the pandemic, consumers are even more concerned about environmental challenges. Around three quarters of the respondents in our survey felt that environmental issues are as concerning as health issues. And around 40% of the consumers intended to make more sustainable behavioral changes in the near future. Yet, the paradox remains. Very few of the consumers who have positive attitude towards eco-friendly products and services actually implement that when it comes to the choices that they are making. 
In order to bridge this intention to action gap, I believe three key challenges need to be resolved. Awareness, believability and cost effectiveness. Firstly, on awareness, consumers need to know a lot more. The biggest sustainability questions on consumers' minds are largely restricted to food waste and plastic packaging waste. Awareness of issues beyond that is fairly limited when it comes to a mass consumer. Secondly, on believability, consumers are very skeptical about the green claims which different products make. A significant proportion of consumers are not really sure that products which claim to be organic have they really been produced using organic farming methods. And thirdly, on cost effectiveness, while the intention is there, very often the sustainable product options available to the consumers are far more expensive. And when it comes to this trade-off, not many consumers are willing to spend extra to, in, order, in order to benefit the environment. Often time we discuss these issues while forgetting the two key ingredients that are needed to make the context as important as it is. We forget nature, we forget youth. We forget nature, which is the very lifeline which supports our biodiversity and our global food chains. And we forget young people who are the very future. We inherit all the actions of the, uh, and the consequences of the decision that we make today. Evidently, the world is facing a planetary emergency and young people are feeling anxious since they are the most exposed generation. And we are entitled to do that. We are not making enough concrete progress on the ecological and climate crisis. But we need to change the narrative and give young people a voice. Because young people have the potential to make real impacts. We have the energy and drive to take action. We are motivated, eager to learn, and we want to, make, and we want to change positively our future. But sometimes we don't have access to the real important resources like technology, training and finances. We need to be listened to and involved in the global decision making processes. My key message to you today, support local markets and scale up of youth agricultural initiatives locally. Finance youth restoration initiatives and programs. To the big global companies here today, respect biodiversity and respect local communities and the lands on which they thrive on. Promote fair trade and build better with youth and nature in mind. Thank you. Moving on to our uh, second panel of five speakers, uh, we'll uh, highlight the necessary levers to develop um, in order to have an impact, but an impact at a global scale. We, we're going to hear uh, from them uh, in, in a second. But first, um, I, I would like uh, to hear from Carlos Manuel Rodriguez. He's a former Costa Rican environment and energy minister and now the CEO and chairs person of the Global Environment facility will deliver his, his message uh, through this uh, this video. Uh, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez was a lawyer uh, by profession, a politician by choice, uh, and was elected as CEO and insurance person at the Global Environment Facility in June uh, 99 and um, is a biodiversity champion and expert and is going to share with us the main conditions necessary to successfully uh, tackle the challenge of biodiversity protection and restoration. Let's hear from him. Hello to everyone. I'm here, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, uh, CEO of the Global Environmental Facility. If there, there is one lesson from COVID-19, <clears throat> is that um, we can no longer manage our environmental and economic pressure uh, separately. We don't know when a full recovery will happen, but we need to plan for it right now. This is a once in a lifetime chance uh, to reset our relationship with nature and scale up investment in nature-based solutions that can help our forests, lands, and oceans absorb carbon and protect uh, wildlife. We have the tools uh, to achieve a green recovery, including through the transformation of perverse uh, business as usual incentives into positive ones. So let's use them. One thing I learned in my terms as Minister of Environment and Energy of the Government of Costa Rica is that the quickest way to get to the heart of a person is through the pocket. When nature becomes the driver for economic growth, stability, prosperity, jobs and income, then nature 
will be hand in hand with uh, human development. The institution I now lead, the Global Environmental Facility, is working with developing countries to address the driver of environmental degradation. With uh, three decades of on-the-ground experience, the GF is in a unique position to help the world build a sustainable recovery to COVID-19 pandemic. Friends, uh, colleagues, uh, nobody can prosper on a sick planet. We all need to recognize it is in our own self-interest to protect nature and invest in it. A greener, more sustainable future is in our hands, and we commit to prioritize nature as the core of our well-being. The GF commits uh, to do its part to achieve the goal and look forward to working with all sectors across the world to make it happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with us uh, today live, uh, Max Kuhn, uh, President uh, and CEO of, of McCain. Ajahn today, uh, Joint Secretary and Program Director at um, News, Nature, Environment and Wildlife Society uh, Funds. Daniel Martz, a Director of Corporate Affairs at JDE and Rosalyn Fujia Ajay, Director for Climate Change at the Forestry Commission of Ghana. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, tonight. I, I would like uh, to start with you, Max Ken. Um, hi, welcome, uh, President and CEO of McCain. You are the, the, the world's leading producer and prepared a potato and appetizer products. I would like to, to ask you, as a family-owned business, um, how does McCain overcome the, the, the challenge posed by this uh, population growth on, on, one th on one side and the climate change on the other side? Hello, Charlotte. Hello, everyone. And thank you for having us. Um, as you said, we're a family company. Our roots are firmly rooted in agriculture. We work directly with thousands of potato farmers on all continents. And therefore, we're experiencing firsthand the disruption caused by climate change. And we've decided that we wanted to be part of the solution in transforming our business towards planet-friendly food. So in addition to substantially reducing our carbon emissions in line with the Paris Agreement, our two major focus areas are reducing food waste and really transforming agriculture towards regenerative agriculture. On the food waste side, Inger Anderson in the introduction highlighted how big a problem food waste is. One staggering statistic is that 28% of all agricultural land in the world is dedicated to producing waste. So that means almost one out of three fields just produces waste. So tackling food waste is an imperative if we want to feed a growing population and protect nature. And this has been an area of focus for us for years, but in this COVID crisis at McCain, we're faced with a very substantial potato surplus when restaurants around the world closed. And uh, at the same time, we're seeing people having um, you know, more and more food insecurity. So one of our key focus areas in the last six months was to make sure in many places in the world that no potato would go to waste. And we're quite, quite proud to have been able to achieve this. On the second topic, regenerative agriculture, we've been working for a few years alongside the farmers that supply us to transition together to an agricultural practices that restore soil health, that restore farm biodiversity, that protect quality of groundwater and reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we've been implementing practices that can be scaled up for a number of years now. We started with 10 farms in Europe to test a few practices such as planting cover crops in the winter, restoring hedges and flower strips in the fields, improving irrigation efficiency, or, and very importantly, using data and analytics to reduce the use of uh, pesticides. And what we've seen is that it takes about three to five years to validate that a practice works. And a practice works if it achieves three things, really. One is that it has a substantial positive impact on the environment. Two, it can be scaled up, that's really important. And three, that it benefits the farmer's livelihood. And a key challenge really is the scaling up, which is why we have decided uh, last year to invest in three farms. We call them farms of the future. The first one starting in Canada, our home country, where we 
we are building a, a commercial sized farm where we want to prove that regenerative agriculture can be economically viable. So what we're implementing there is a combination of regenerative agricultural practices and technology and data to measure the impact of those practices. Because we know that farmers believe what they see. And we have to remember that within the food system, the farmers are the most fragile, often struggling to make a living. And in those circumstances, we can't expect the farmers, you know, the stewards of the land, to invest into new ways of working and take risks if they're not making a decent living. So we as food producers like McCain, but also retailers and players in the food service have a responsibility to support farmers in this much needed transformation of agriculture. And the most effective way of doing that is you know, each company having their plans, of course, but also collaborating. And which is why this OP2B coalition is so important because it's really about bringing companies that have a strong connection to agriculture. We've heard a few examples uh, during this uh, hour to implement a transformation towards not only sustainable agriculture, but regenerative agriculture at scale. And, and it, I really want to insist on that, improve the farmer's livelihood. So companies definitely have a big role to play, but I also want to say that without the support of public uh, authorities of states and financial institutions to direct funds to support farmers in adopting new practices, we will not be able to get to the scale. So um, it's really a, a big effort of collaboration, private sector, public sector, financial sector. Thank you very much, Max uh, Kern, and I think you have um, an illustration um, of, of, of what you, of this um, scaling up practices that you're talking about, and uh, I would like um, to share these uh, images all together. Ik ben Jan Lampert, ik leid uh, samen met mijn vrouw een, uh, een akkerbouwbedrijf. Ik werk nu al 27 jaar samen met McCain. De teeltmanager Chris die komt gewoon uh, uit zichzelf uh, om de paar weken langs om, de, om even uh, de stand van de gewassen door te nemen. Van de week dan uh, stond de rijen toch mooi gesloten, want dan eigenlijk een beetje bladbedekking boven de ruggen. Je kent ook jouw bedrijfsvoering en jouw inzet voor je bedrijf. Wat denk je van zullen we ze aan te zitten? Nog je koffie op. Ja, goed. We hebben nu zelfs ook bloemeranden ingezaaid in samenwerking met McCain, zodat er een goed bioleven ontstaat naast het aardappelveld. En dat kan dan een meerwaarde geven voor de teelt, zodat je beter je bladluizen kan bestrijden. Zodat je waarschijnlijk minder gewasbeschermingsmiddelen hoeft te gebruiken. Dat is heel leuk. Luizen in de aardappels, die bent er ook heel veel minder. Ik ben ook veel minder. Naast het bloemenproject heeft McCain ook proefvelden, zodat daar wel 30 rassen aardappelen geteeld worden. Nou, dat ziet er wel leuk uit. Ja. Het is echt een, een frietras, he, omdat hij zo mooi van vorm is. Voornamelijk is ook de grondsoort afhankelijk hoe goed een gewas groeit. Om daar zo goed mogelijk rendement mee te halen. En waar je zo weinig mogelijk milieubelasting mee geeft. Als je zo'n veld aardappelen helemaal tot je mag rekenen en dat je daarvoor mag zorgen. Dat geeft een ontzettend goed gevoel. Dan ben je echt rentmeester van de natuur. We're going to see now together that scalability is more challenging in the field of restoration than production because of the specificity of each ecosystem, each community. Um, we are now going uh, together to eastern India uh, in the suburbs in a, an archipelago of islands that form the largest estuarine mangrove ecosystem in the world. And we're going to meet um, Ajahn today in partnership with lovely hood funds she is leading. You're going to see a outstanding uh, project launched in 2000. 
2011, aiming at rebuilding an entire ecosystem of mangroves, restoring uh, biodiversity and creating economics opportunities for communities. Agenda, the floor is yours and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Charlotte, and I feel privileged to be here today. Well, Sundarbans is a land of uh, mangroves, tigers, and 45 million people live in this desperate delta. And how is life possible there? Because the village islands are all surrounded by embankments, they are earthen, and this protect the villages from the uh, high tide waters twice every day. So Nature, Environment and Wildlife Society News has been working there in trying to develop uh, community-based mangrove restoration models uh, on the river side of the embankments so that they create a bio shield and protect the embankments which happen to be the lifeline of the people of the Sundarban. Uh, now, we in, uh, in 2009, May, uh, we were hit by a cyclone Isla. And in, during that time, we saw that the embankments breached because there were no mangroves and there was saline intrusion. And this curse of the saline was prevalent on all the agricultural fields. There was nothing for three years. So after that, we tried to upscale uh, and looking for opportunities uh, into upscale the model that we had created. Uh, and we met with livelihoods. The Livelihoods Carbon Fund is uh, the financing mechanism of it is a very innovative uh, private investment model, you can say, where the private companies are trying to leverage the carbon mechanism in order to restore uh, the key ecosystem, uh, key natural ecosystems, and also secure uh, social and economic opportunities for the uh, coastal communities. So we decided to work together because we are all aligned. We thought ourselves aligned. And the project started implementing. And now, after 10 years, we have got in Sundarban, 5,000 hectares of mangrove forest restored. 16 million trees have been planted. In 2011, where we planted in around 500 hectares of mangroves, there were only 50 crab collectors. And now we find there are 500 crab collectors. So you can see that the biodiversity is streaming now. The community benefits are also flowing because uh, 18,000 women had worked with us. And they have been trained, skilled on raising nurseries on 17 mangrove species. And some of them, the men and the women from the communities, to rock pillars, build their own ownership, save the mangroves as their own mangroves. And we could readily recognize the stewardship and supported them with income generation opportunities so that they can continue with their stewardship. And thanks again to Livelihoods because we could develop and establish a supply chain around the mangroves, valorizing it and it is named under the brand name of Badabon Harvest, and it has done exemplary services during the COVID situation, connecting the Sundarban producers, the farmers to Kolkata, the city consumers, and providing doorstep delivery to the senior citizens. So you see that in this context, when uh, again in May 2020, a cyclone Amphan had hit the Sundarbans, there was again devastation. But the mangrove forest that grew with the livelihoods, it protected the embankments and the communities were safe. And so we can, so it is very evident and visible that the, the these type of uh, upfront investment projects, which has long-term uh, scaling, long-term resource planning, can has the ability to create transformative effects on the uh, on the landscapes, on the restoration landscapes, and build resilience of the coastal communities, bring nature-based solutions, and um, and really has uh, create synergies between biodiversity, business, and communities. Thank Ashita, you. If you if you agree, we're gonna we're gonna see uh, the illustration of all you, what you're saying with mm -hmm. with a little uh, video. Thank you yes. so much. Mm -hmm. The Sundarbans forest is the largest block of tidal mangrove in the world. It stretches across the border of India and Bangladesh in the Ganges Delta. 
In the Sundarbans, men have gradually cleared the mangrove and colonized these islands situated below sea level. Living here is a constant struggle against the elements. In order to prevent salt water from flooding the cultures, as well as to protect their home, the villagers have no other choice but to build embankments that constitute the lifelines of the Sundarbans. In May 2009, the Sundarbans were in the path of the storm Ayla. Everything was destroyed. In the aftermath, local people noticed that the sea walls protected by residual mangroves had better resisted the storm. The Indian NGO News and the Livelihoods Fund therefore initiated a vast afforestation program. Their objective is to plant 60 million mangrove trees, over 6,000 hectares, a considerable job requiring tremendous enthusiastic impetus. At the end of the project, these young mangroves will protect the villages. Thanks to their biomass productivity, they will also store 700,000 tons of carbon dioxide, whilst promoting biodiversity, and so the renewal of natural resources for the population. We are all doing this to save the Sundarbans. We do participate because without forest, we cannot survive. And we are poor people, you know. This project is also important as we get some jobs and new incomes. With the certain commodity sustainable production and ecosystem restoration go hand in hand, the soil is so degraded in some areas that climate change threatens the very existence of the industry. Jacob Dewey Egbert's JDE, for example, a leading pure player coffee company, benefits from the tremendous growth of coffee consumption worldwide. But when, meanwhile, coffee production is increasingly challenging. Uh, Daniel Mars um, is with us tonight, and I would like uh, to have his um, opinion on um, how GDE's approach towards a sustainable coffee value uh, chain. Can you explain us this? Hi, Charlotte, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this really important event. Uh, climate change is a, a very serious issue in coffee, and it threatens viable coffee production in the long term and the medium term. Uh, in the short term, smallholder coffee farmers are essential in getting this right, and they're struggling a bit with um, some low coffee prices over the last year. We believe at JDE that support for smallholder coffee farmers is absolutely essential in ensuring that we can tackle both the climate challenge issue, but also their livelihoods and the prosperity of their families. Uh, we do that through the JDE Common Grounds Program. It's a program which is designed around the principle of good agricultural practices for smallholder farmers. Uh, by 2025, we want to reach 500 of those thousand, 500,000 of those smallholder coffee farmers. Uh, but the real key to that pro project, the JDE Common Grounds program, is that it's it has a strong belief in the power of public-private partnerships. We don't believe we can do it alone. We want to support smallholder farmers by working with governments, non-governmental organizations, our suppliers, our competitors sometimes, and it's essentially the smallholder farmers, the villages, and the cooperatives that they're members of to ensure that they engage in the kind of agricultural practices which will ensure that the soil is protected, the forests are protected, and in fact that they can even increase their yields and earn better income. I think one of our better examples of this, just one example, is an example of our project in Peru where we're working with our supplier Olam, we're working with the United States Agency for International Development, and we're working with local NGO Parahusa to ensure that the smallholder farmers of Peru are taking good care of their crops and earning a better living while doing so. I think uh, perhaps we can share that video with you at this time. Yes, yes, 
I would like, uh, I, I was going to say it because we have this video and of course um, we're going to, we're going to share it uh, for a last quick question right after that. Ah, sí, yo toda la vida me he dedicado a la producción de café. Para mí el café es muy importante por los ingresos que tenemos. Si yo perdiera eh, las plantas de café, para mí sería una pérdida o crisis para mi hogar. He aprendido lo que es este manejo de, de lo que es café. Lo que antes no, no lo no, no sé, cosechaban solamente por cosechar, ¿no? Eh, sembraban solamente por sembrar. Estoy orgulloso que la finca está, está dando resultados, las, las capacitaciones de hoy. Los productores, mediante el proyecto, son beneficiados mediante talleres de capacitación que les ayuda a fortalecer sus capacidades. El productor aprende, por ejemplo, a, a podar las fincas, aprende a fertilizar aprende a realizar un módulo de, de beneficio. Esta bicicleta es para ahorrar un poco combustible y no contaminar el medio ambiente. No, la secadora solar sirve para secar ahí el café, darle un mejor trato, no ya no secar en el suelo, sino así en alto para que seque limpio. Bueno, en el proyecto Café nos enseñan ¿no? cómo podríamos formar un equipo para unir, unirnos. Lo que más me enorgullece el proyecto, que las familias se sientan felices, que hayan mejorado su nivel económico. Las capacitaciones me han ayudado muchísimo para manejar mejor mis cafetales, enseñándome a reflorestar para cuidar nuestra flora y fauna. Me vería de aquí a cinco años, si Dios me presta la vida, siempre ofreciendo un café de calidad y cuidando el medio ambiente. Our uh, last uh, guest tonight uh, in this panel is Rosaline Fujiwa Adje. Uh, you're going to see as a um, coffee producer, the example of, of Ghana speaks for itself to the extent that the production of, of coffee relies on sound ecosystems and in particular the forest. Uh, Rosaline Fuja Ade, can you tell us why uh, the Ghanaian experience is so special? Thank you so much and uh, greetings to everybody who has joined us. Thank you for having Ghana um, on this uh, particular event, which has been so enriching. And um, Ghana's case has been very interesting and one that is worth sharing and learning from. And because we believe that we have set up the right uh, pillars um, for engagement. And three key things have been very instrumental in our fight against deforestation and forest degradation particularly in our commodity landscapes. Um, I, I heard um, in the previous panel about what is happening on share and Ghana is also doing same on share and then particularly also on cocoa. And these three key pillars, um, the very fast first one of them is about the fact that we believe in strategic partnerships. I have heard this from the other um, panelists. And for Ghana, we have realized that we cannot do it alone. And what has even made us realize this is the fact that we have all these actors in the landscape, but we have still been experiencing the issues of deforestation and de degradation, which meant that we all had to come together um, um, through a concerted action. And we had to define how we come together. So because we want results, we want to be able to measure whatever we are uh, going to do at the end of the day, because we are, we are contributing to climate action. 
So we have devised different um, partnership agreements. It could be that we are coming together through MOUs, through framework agreements, through letters of agreements or letters of assignments. And we sign um, these agreements and we have responsibilities and roles that are time bound and um, that are allocated to each partner, be it government, private sector, be it a local community member, a farmer, or a traditional authority, because we all have a say in this landscape. Now, after the strategic partnerships are done, the second pillar that we realize is very, very important is about our governance structures. And um, this is one thing that we are very proud of. Um, we have innovative and very creative governance structures that have evolved within the space of our fight against deforestation and degradation. Now, how these governance structures are, 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 are put in place is that they are uh, structured and tiered right from the community level, through the district level, through the regional level, and then through the national level. And we make sure that each constituent from the community district region bring up their executives, bring up their nominations, and eventually they come together to form a landscape management board. And this landscape management board is in charge of the activities of a particular landscape um, within our cocoa growing area, and what we also hope to replicate in our share um, landscape. And this has been very phenomenal because if you don't have the right governance structures, you might not be inclusive enough, which might not be a very good incentive for all your partners to feel a part. We need representation, we need inclusiveness, nobody should be left out. And these governance structures are so robust and so fine that you have private sector companies in there, you have government in there, you have the communities in there, and we're all engaging. And then lastly, our last pillar has been on the fact that we have been able to attract different sources of funding. So sustainable and multifaceted finance has been one of our key selling points. And um, Ghana's Red Plus process started with the FCPF. Now we have had the UN Red coming to help us set up a safeguards information system, which is now documenting everything that we are doing with our governance structures. And then also we have just developed another program which has received approval from the GCF with the UNDP that is going to enhance safeguards information system to the national level so that every program that is addressing deforestation can come in there. And to wrap Thank up, you. I believe- Thank you, Rosaline. Thank you. Thank we you. have too many- and examples of the amazing work uh, you're, you're doing in Ghana. Thank you so much for being uh, with us uh, tonight. Um, we are now um, very close to the end of this uh, mm -hmm. show and I would like uh, to introduce Agnes uh, Kalibata, Special Envoy for the 2021 um, Food System Summit. Um, Agnes, you are responsible for engaging cooperation with key leaders and I would like to know um, today, if you were optimistic on the system, sustainable uh, development goals, are you optimistic in our collective ability to do so? Thank you, Sherrod, and um, thank you, really thank you to all the people that came before me that did present uh, really uh, great ideas around what we could do uh, and um, how we could influence what is happening in our environment. We are living uh, through uh, difficult times, uh, unprecedented uh, times of biodiversity loss, we are seeing uh, whether it's because of um, the work ourselves, what, how we impact the environment, but also uh, climate change is adding another dimension to it, whether it's the fires, the floods, you know, everything that's happening because of climate change is also undermining biodiversity loss. So I want to, see, to say that um, there's a sense of urgency we must bring to this work uh, if we need to really um, reverse the, the, the current trend. And that's why the UN Secretary General launched the Decade of Action. And the Food System Summit is one of the, the pieces of work that we must deliver against uh, due, uh, for the Decade of Action. Now, the Food System Summit recognizes that food, how we produce food, how we consume it, how we transport it, everything we do is part of the problem. But also, I want to reassure you that the food system does present a solution to, to what is going on. So from that perspective, we need to find a transition mechanism that takes us to a new place. And I want to tell you that I've had a lot of people talk about farmers and how farming communities are impacted. I'm a daughter of a smallholder farmer myself. These people and, and indigenous communities care so much about the environments they live in. The degradation that we see the deforestation that we see is not a choice that they want to live through. For them, the environment means so much. 
It is their food, but it's also their medicine. It's also a lot of knowledge that they want to give to their children. It's also a, a culture, it's a way of life. For them, it's really so much. So they want to protect it. And I've seen this in Kenya, where we are working with GEF, UNDP, and UNEP, and we are helping communities actually to, to really um, protect their environments. And what we've learned, and so many people have said it, Daniel and, and, and Rosalind said it very well, we can't do it unless we are partnering. Uh, we can't achieve anything unless we are partnering. So I want to encourage us all to think through the kind of partnership we need to make to make sure we come through. I want to leave you with three questions. One, and, and having listened to you all, is the scale we are aiming for large enough? Is the ambition we are talking about great enough? I mean, just think about restoration. We need to restore degraded lands equivalent from an agricultural perspective at least, equivalent to the size of South America. So are our ambitions large enough? Is the urgency we are talking about strong enough to, to, to really reverse um, the fact that we are not coming through in the SDGs and help us to achieve biodiversity, regain our biodiversity in the next, or even be on the right track in the next 10 years of, of SDGs? So if you, if you care about these things, and if you care about what happens to us as individuals, but also to our environment and the future of our children, you need to be part of the Food System Summit. This is the conversation we are having. We have dialogues that will happen at country level. I would like to encourage you all to join. We have dialogues that are happening online. I would like to encourage you to join. We have action tracks where many of the ideas you talked about will come to fruition. Please join those action tracks and show that your ideas are heard. So my call to you is be part of the conversation and be part of taking this conversation to other people as well. We can only change this if we own it at every level of society, country, community, individual. So thank you so much for inviting me and, and uh, really I uh, would like to encourage you all to, to join us. Uh, we must change and we must turn this perspective around. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Agnes, to, to share um, this. Is the scale enough? Is the ambition enough? Uh, we Maybe we can close uh, this uh, session with those really important questions. Um, thank you uh, to all of you wonderful panelists we, who were with us um, uh, tonight, uh, some of them at a later uh, hour. Uh, I was very honored uh, to have had the privilege to moderate uh, this session uh, and, and to give a place to biodiversity. Take care and see you soon. Thank you all so much for joining the first day of the Nature for Life Hub. Tomorrow, September 25th, we start again at 9 a.m. Eastern, exploring the theme of business and finance. To stay tuned, visit us at the official UNDP Twitter account at UNDP Life and at natureforlifehub.org. And remember to follow the hashtag Nature for Life for more updates. It has been a great pleasure to be your guide through this first day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Ciao.